to our today's PCS IBS seminar. It's a great pleasure to have with us uh, today uh, on site uh, Professor Paul Pierce uh, from uh, University of Melbourne. And our usual introduction. Um, and our scientific host today uh, is Sergey. And uh, Sergey, please uh, feel free to introduce our speaker. Okay, yeah, welcome everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, host uh, Paul Pierce today here. Uh, Paul has been with our center uh, or with some special also activities of our center for quite a while and was a frequent visitor to our place uh, way before the pandemic started. And uh, let me first uh, give you some facts about him for those of you who especially see him for the first time. Uh, he uh, is affiliated with the University of Melbourne uh, and also with the uh, University, University of Queensland. In Queensland in Brisbane, right? Right, right. There we go. And uh, he did his PhD in seven, 1977 uh, at the University of Melbourne. And uh, uh, although he actually originally comes from England. So he somehow made his way first to, uh, uh, to Australia. And then uh, he, after his PhD, went to the US, where he uh, had several research days at uh, various places, for instance, at the Carnegie Mellon University of Pittsburgh, and then uh, at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And then he moved uh, to a longer term research fellow position at the Australian National University of Canberra to work uh, with the uh, Baxter. With Baxter, thank you. And then um, from then on, he moved uh, up to Leather at the University of Melbourne to lecture, senior lecture associate and full professor, uh, where he is still an honorary professor of fellow and also same honorary professor of fellow at the University of Queensland. He did a lot of, uh, he is doing a lot of uh, research, uh, mostly I would say in. Uh, field theory and maybe mathematical physics, we could say integrable systems. Um, uh, he told me that uh, that uh, there is no such thing as quantum integrability. Sometimes, or maybe you changed your mind. I like to hold you. Maybe it's um, anyway. Uh, he was in particular also very uh, strongly, or is very strongly uh, involved in activities at the uh, APCTP in Wuhan, and uh, in this. Uh, it was this reason which brought us actually together a couple of years uh, ago in the KTX when we moved back from the, I think the 20 year celebration of APCTP. And that uh, was the start of the idea to have a regional network spawn of uh, governed, so to say, by uh, ICTP from Trieste, which we then set up a motion and was running very successful for three years until the pandemic hit. And uh, there was just the time for it to be renewed. And as you can guess, it was. Uh, because the world went into dark mode. And now the world is again resurfacing and everyone cries, give us our network back. And so we are very happy and working with Paul on that and uh, hope that uh, next year maybe something uh, nice can be announced to everyone. But uh, today he will uh, tell us more about critical site percolation on the triangle of lattice with lots of uh, additional things. I will not read them all. Right. Please, Paul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sergey. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back in uh, Dijon, the PCS IBS, after three years' uh, absence uh, due to uh, COVID. Uh, I must say, I'm somewhat embarrassed by the long introduction. It was very kind of Sergey, but it just makes me realize I'm getting very old. It was a short version. <laughs> okay. So, uh, before I start on the talk today, I thought I'd start with some advertising. Hmm. Now this doesn't work. There we go. Help, please. Ah, oh, but I want to go backwards. Okay, no, it's fine. So let me start with some advertising. As uh, Sergey said, we're going to uh, start up our uh, network again. We were uh, dormant for three years. We operated between 2017, 2019 with the first iteration. Now we want to iterate for the years 23 to 25. We're expanding the network now to uh, seven nodes to include Indonesia and uh, Cambodia. So the message is, we hope that everybody here will please participate. Uh, while I'm doing some advertising, I'd like to point out that there is an association of Asia Pacific Physical Societies, and they have a journal called the, the AAPPS 
bulletin. Uh, we're trying to improve the quality of this uh, bulletin. It's now published by Springer Nature. I've been uh, appointed a senior editor for statistical physics and related uh, subjects. Uh, they have very strong condensed matter physics, so don't worry. And please submit review articles and research articles. So that's the end of the advertisement. So it's a very long title today, but basically it's a, a problem in statistical physics in uh, two dimensions, looking at critical site percolation on the triangular lattice. It turns out that this is an exactly integrable model, and we're interested here to use that exact integrability to calculate conformal properties to establish universality between site percolation on the triangular lattice and bond percolation on the square lattice. So a little over three years ago, I gave a talk entitled Critical Bond Percolation Along the Square Lattice. So I talked about the exact solution or the conformal properties of that critical system. And today I want to do something similar for site percolation, but site percolation is much more complicated. Bond percolation on the square lattice is described by an SL2 model. Side percolation on the triangular lattice is described by an SL3 model, and so therefore it's inherently more complicated. So here are my collaborators, Alexis Moen de Chen, he's a French Canadian, Andreas Bumpa, he's German, and this guy is Australian, or at least identifies as Australian. All right, so let's start with a hexagonal lattice. Uh, you occupy the uh, faces of the hexagonal uh, lattice with probability one half. So probability one half is occupied, probability one half is not occupied. So you just toss a coin. Uh, the centers of the hexagonal faces or cells, they form a triangular lattice. So there's the triangular lattice. You can see the triangular lattice drawn over here. Now you can look at these local variables. They're just like spins, spin up and spin down, if you like, using uh, model occupation numbers for particles. But they're not very interesting. They're uh, independent, identically distributed random variables. So if you take those as your observables, you look at correlation functions of uh, those variables, they factorize. And they factorize trivially. So all correlations are just trivial. In fact, if you take this model and just look at the local degrees of freedom, the partition function is exactly one. This is actually a stochastic model. So it's totally trivial. The central charge is uh, C equals zero. There's very little you can do. In percolation, what you're interested in is the clusters. You can see the clusters here. You can think of white clusters or purple clusters. It doesn't make any difference. There's a duality. The question in percolation is these uh, clusters can grow and you're interested in whether the clusters span, percolate from one side to the other side of a very large lattice. You're interested in statistical properties of the clusters. These little occupation numbers are not very good in finding out those properties. So the idea, <clears throat> which took a long time to get to, is you move from those useless uh, local degrees of freedom to non-local degrees of freedom in the form of loop segments. So what you do is you just look at the surrounding contours for each of these white clusters. You can get closed contours, or you can get uh, contours to start and end on the boundary. Now these contain non-local information. They tell you about what's happening with the clusters. By studying the statistics of this model, you can actually find what you're interested in. Now, we want to apply Yang Baxter technology. So, you can see there is a mapping from this configuration of occupying sites of the triangular lattice with probability one half to this configuration of loop segments just by drawing surrounding contours. And now you see the triangular lattice here. And now we just shift this so that it's upright. And now we get a square lattice. But the triangular lattice is still here because the rhombi with two triangular faces now become a square with two triangular faces. Now that's important. Where do you see the, the circle there in the left part? So in the middle part, yeah, this circle, no, in the left part. In the left. 
It's important that we have a square because we want to use Yang Baxter technology. And but when you talk about percolating, when you talk about the cluster, it's probably all the blue stuff, right? Which you all white. There's a duality here. It makes no difference which you regard as occupied or unoccupied. Okay. So no, but what you show there is the white. This this one is a little white. Uh, mm -hmm. You can imagine an isolated purple one. You use a triangle, the door of the hexagon. Yes, it's a jewel. It's easier to see the clusters here because the clusters are connected. It, it takes a, a bit more to explain what a cluster is than a triangular lattice. So if you occupy these two sides and so on, you, you have to start talking about the bonds that connect them to define what's meant by a cluster. Here, the clusters are clear visually. Once you have a square lattice, now you can start to apply Yang Baxter technology, and what's important is the configurations that allow for the square faces. So in, in this solution, how, how do you deal with uh, the diagonal line? We, we forget they're there. We remove this one set of diagonals, we forget they're there, and we look only at the configurations of the squares. You'll see in a moment. So here I just list some uh, previous papers working up to building up to this particular paper. And here's the reference to the uh, previous paper on bond percolation. Are you these diagonal lines are irrelevant? Once we start to uh, use Yang Baxter technology because you need the faces, but they will reappear, you'll see, because there's an SL3, so there's some sort of threefold symmetry going on in the background. Now, <clears throat> I want to go to the continuum scaling limit, which is when you shrink the lattice spacing to zero. This is where you can see uh, universal behavior most clearly. So I'm interested in universality. And on Friday, uh, <clears throat> Sergei spoke about non-equilibrium, uh, non-integrable. But I'm working in the context of equilibrium and integrable in two dimensions. So, uh, you're used to models in statistical physics, such as the Easing model and Potts models. And uh, <clears throat> in the continuum scaling limit, these models are described by uh, CFTs, and they're the scaling and universal behavior as manifest. These Easing and Potts models have local degrees of freedom. We've now moved to non-local degrees of freedom in the form of loop segments. When, when do you get uh, non-local models like this? Well, one example is what we're looking at today, percolation. Another one is polymers. These long strands can be thought of as polymers. So if you're studying these sorts of models, then you want to study non-local degrees of freedom. These theories are called rational, and these are called logarithmic. Why? If you look at the correlators or rational models, that is with local degrees of freedom, you get algebraic decay with power laws, and those power laws usually are expressed as fractions, rational fractions. That's the origin of the name rational, but that's a misnomer because when you look at logarithmic theories, you can get algebraic decay, but you also encounter logarithms and you can have decay or growth. And again, the uh, power laws are fractions. So that's a little confusing. You might think only fractions over here. That's not the case. What sort of representations do you get for the CFT? Here you get unitary or non-unitary. Over here you want to get non-unitary. What about the representation types? So here you get irreducible representations of the Virasora algebra. Over here you get irreducible or reducible yet indecomposable. So you see life is starting to get more complicated over here. What about the number of different representations? <laughs> For a rational theory, you only have a finite number of irreducible representations that close among themselves under fusion. Over here, you have an infinite number. The rhythmic theories are more complicated. And then in the CFT, you have characters. Here, they're just virus or minimal, but here they're logarithmic cats or affi. They'll be irreducible as a whole raft of different characters that enter into these more complicated logarithmic theories. So in this context, we have a good idea of what 
universality means. Over here, we're not exactly sure. So two rational CFTs lie in the same universality class. If they have the same CFT, CFT data, which includes the central charge C, the operator or field content, which is just finite number of irreducible reps in the case of rational theories, there, then, then is the associated conformal weights, conformal weights uh, delta, and the conformal characters. And lastly, conformal partition functions. So if they have these and maybe a few other things in common, we say they're in the same universality class, and this is precise. So uh, for example, hard squares, that's not integrable, but it's in the same universality class as the easing model. It just has a simple Z2 symmetry. Hard hexagons is in the same universality class as the three-state POTS model. They have a uh, three-state uh, symmetry. Yeah, the symmetric group on three objects is the symmetry of those what boxes. What is hard referring? Hmm? What is hard referring? Uh, these are uh, particles which you tie on a lattice to feel the lattice, but they're not allowed to overlap. Then they move on either a square lattice or... Yeah, they're drawn on a square lattice. Or a hard hexagon. And hard hexagons, square lattice with one set of diagonals. Okay. So the one question is, what does universality mean in the context of log CFTs when we're over here? <clears throat> Folklore dictates that site and bond percolation are in the same universality class. So when people measure numerically or in the lab uh, power law behaviors, they get uh, rational numbers that are the same for site and bond population. And that holds independent of the lattice structure, whether you're on a square, triangular, or whatever lattice. What we'd like to do is try to make that a more precise okay. statement. Do you have any some, some transformation from rational model to There's no transformation as such because they're not equivalent. You can reach one as a limit from the other. So these uh, logarithmic uh, theories can be obtained in a certain limit from rational theories. Because here you have a finite number. You have to go from finite number of representations to an infinite number. You can only do that in a certain limit. So uh, the easing model, plus models, <coughs> there is the so-called minimal models. If you go to a certain uh, limit of minimal models, you get logarithmic minimal models. That's the association between the two. So in the logarithmic, you have the low, non-local operator. So what do you mean by decay of row in this sense? Ah, I, I didn't use the word operator, you did. So I'm just talking about degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedom is something that lives at the uh, level of the statistical mechanics. Uh, there are no, all operators in CFT are local. All right, let me briefly uh, describe the scaling and universality for critical percolation. So we're in T 2D. Uh, the number of physical quantities you can look at, the number of clusters per site, the percolation probability, this is the order parameter for these uh, systems, truncated mean cluster size, the cluster volume, the correlation length, and lastly, the decay with separation of the probability that two sides belong to the same cluster. All of these uh, physical properties, quantities, uh, behave with power laws as you approach the critical point, which for the uh, percolation on the triangular lattice is PC equals one half. Uh, alpha is minus two thirds, beta this is 536 and so on. They all take these rational values. And uh, although there's six of them, they're really described in terms of uh, CFT in terms of two independent form formal weights, the thermal and magnetic thermal weights, uh, <laughs> and formal weights, which are these. This one is five eighths, this one's five nine six. So if you substitute these two values in here for delta T and delta H, you get these, all six of these uh, rational fractions. Now these conformal weights, 
they're labeled by two indices, R and S, which can be integers or half integers, positive or zero. And there's a cat's formula for these conformal weights. It's just this simple expression here, which you'll recognize as the cat's formula. Percolation has a central charge, C equals zero. So let's compare this with the Ising model. The Ising model is C equals one half, and there's only three conformal weights, zero, one sixteenth, and a half. That's the identity, uh, magnetization, and energy. They're the operators that enter. <clears throat> Here we have an infinite number. So this is the uh, scaling theory for uh, percolation. However, we have to remember the percolation is not rational, it's logarithmic. So we have to see what it means to be universal. Sorry, the, uh, the, the previous slide, uh, how do you know that how many the, the critical exponents uh, are? So, uh, <clears throat> right, so <clears throat> the conformal weights are actually conjugate to boundary conditions when you study the system on a strip. And uh, these systems admit integrable boundary conditions, and you find that there's a, an infinite number of solutions to the boundary yang baxter equations. And when you solve those, lo and behold, all of these conformal weights come out. So it tells you how many exponents there are. Yeah, so for the easy model, there are three boundary conditions. This is, um, uh, let me see, I have to remember, plus, you said everybody plus uh, this one uh, free and this one all minus. You know, on the bottom. Uh, yes, yeah, so there are two boundaries plus plus, that's this guy, plus minus, that's this guy, free plus free, that's that guy. So that's on a stripe. Strip. Mm. Strip. And what about the other two sides? So this is on two sides this year. Yeah, so you take a very, very long strip. I see. Oh, and then you look at the then then you 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 look at the uh, finite size you behavior look at the calculation from left to right. Yes, that's good. Okay, that's the idea. And the different s's are coming from where? There are these different r's and s's. Look good. These are labels for the different boundary conditions. And so why? Is so this one is r equals s equals one. Yeah. This so is r equal to one, s equals two, r equals one, s equals three. Right, but the, what makes their, uh, the number of, uh, of them? Ah, so here you find an infinite number of solutions right. for integrable boundary conditions. What are these different ones? Uh, yeah, so here they're easy to characterize because it's uh, completely ordered, right? All plus or all minus or free. When you have more states, you can have partially free. And when you have an infinite number of states, you can have an infinite number of partially free. And that's the situation. That's exactly how it's constructed as a limit from uh, rational minimal models. It's R and S that go to infinity. And so you have all of these. All right, let me define the dilute A22. So this is the <laughs> twisted affine A2 model. We don't have to worry about this. This is a, a Lie algebra. Uh, the Lie algebra plays no role here. Uh, it's <laughs> Possible to construct a solution of the Yang Baxter equation starting with the definition of the Lie algebra, but uh, I won't do that here. We only need to know what the solution is. And here is a face of the lattice. The uh, <clears throat> one set of diagonals is no longer put in. And now here are the nine possible configurations that we saw can come out when you. Uh, <clears throat> Do the mapping I started with from the hexagonal lattice to square lattices. Now, in the A22 model, there are two free parameters. One is the uh, spectral parameter U. So these happen with certain probabilities, which are encoded in these nine weights, which are just trigonometric functions of the spectral parameter U. And then there is also a crossing parameter, which in general is uh, free, but we want to connect with side percolation at P equal PC equals one half, where each of these first eight faces get a weight of one, and this one doesn't occur, so it must have a weight of zero. And that occurs when 
the crossing parameter lambda is fixed to pi on three. In addition, we uh, restrict later to u equal to pi on three as well. But in the meantime, we need u there because we will be interested in the transfer matrices which commute for various u, and that gives us the power we need to be able to solve exactly. So you see, these are just trigonometric functions. Everything's expressed in terms of signs. So you should think of a weight as being replaced by this linear combination of uh, nine possibilities. Now, <clears throat> we have to focus on the loop segments. We want to talk about spectra. In CFT, you have, uh, you have uh, spectra. To get spectra, we have to act diagrammatically with these faces on states to write down a matrix representation. Only when you have a matrix representation can you look at the eigenvalues and start to study the conformal spectra. So we have to work uh, in a diagrammatic algebra. And these nine tiles actually diagrammatically generate an algebra that's called the dilute templi lieb algebra. Templi and Lieb introduced the dense templi lieb algebra initially to study percolation. Uh, here we're actually looking at the dilute version. In the dense version, you only have these two faces, but uh, you don't have to have two loop segments going through every face in the dilute extension of that algebra. That algebra admits three types of representations. Vertex, in that case, we're talking about the azergan coropin 19 vertex model. RSOS, that's restricted solid on solid, so heights, that's the dilute RSOS models, or dilute loop models, and that's what we're interested in here when we work just with these faces diagrammatically. Now, these faces satisfy certain local relations. This one is the famous yang baxter equation. This is what makes everything integral and makes everything work. Now, what I mean by a dash line here is this dash means it can carry a loop segment or be empty. So dilute means you have vacancies. So this can be nothing joining these or a loop segment can join these, which means the loop segment must continue somewhere in these faces in some way. So when I say these are equal, you should think of it diagrammatically. You draw all possible diagrams, associate the weight coming from these weights on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and you'll see that they are actually equal. There's also an inversion relation. So the spectral parameter here is replaced by minus u. Here we had u, v, and u plus v. This row eight is given here. That's just a scalar. So the product of these two, think of acting upwards, gives you a single face back again, or actually this is a sum of four faces because each of one of these can carry a loop segment or not. So it's actually the sum of four. Uh, this one, this one, uh, I missed one. Yeah, this one, this one, this one, and this one. They all act as the identity going from this corner to that corner. So this is the inversion relation. So there are a number of local relations that are important. Now, how do we get from the square lattice model to back to the triangular lattice? Well, as I said, you want to uh, <clears throat> take lambda to pi on three. That's the crossing parameter. So when I take the general weights and now take lambda to pi on three, then I get specialized uh, face weights. Everything is simpler now. Everybody has a factor of SU, so I remove that. And these are the simpler weights for the commuting family of transfer matrices that will give us percolation, side percolation on the triangular lattice. More specifically, to get uh, pure side percolation, I have to also set u equal to pi on three. When I do that, uh, <coughs> each of the weights of these first eight tiles becomes one, and the weight of the last tile becomes zero, it disappears. So there's only eight tiles left. All with weight one. So that's what happens when I specialize first lambda to pi on three and then also u to pi on three. 
And this combination factorizes in terms of triangles. So now you see this one set of diagonals is coming back again. I denote this set of this triangle with a little square box. It expands into a sum of four triangles in all possible ways. So I think of trying to draw these triangles in this position or this position in all possible ways. So you can see if I had the uh, line going here, I'd have uh, one loop there and one loop there, and they connect in the middle. If uh, a loop segment terminates in the interior, that's set to zero, that's not allowed. So when you look at all possibilities, by substituting this into the, um, this is what you get. So what happens if P is not equal to PC and lambda are not equal to pi over P? Can you remove this, this diagonal? Okay, so <clears throat> there's a lot to say on that. If you're not a criticality, you don't have isotopy. So these algebras that underlie this actually describe not theory. Not theory is what happens to these loop segments when you deform them continuously. Away from criticality, you lose that. So there are no loop models of criticality. Loop models are specialized only to studying critical models. You can move off criticality, but then you have to work with an infinite number of heights instead. And I don't want to talk about that today. And sorry, there was a second part, or was that that it? Ah, yeah, if you move P away from PC, you're no longer at criticality. So that's what happens, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so we're interested in... May I ask yeah. question that here the, you have an inverted symmetry because the uh, you consider the triangle. Sorry, uh, you're saying there is a symmetry emerging here. That's because it's yeah. triangular symmetry. Yes. This is yeah. how triangular symmetry is compatible with square. So, so you, if you consider the square lattice, uh, you have a different uh, types of the, the, the phases. Like Sorry, if you consider the difference, consider the, the square. Yeah. Uh, that is instead of the triangular geometry, then the, yes. uh, you have a different type of ties. So, <clears throat> side percolation on square lattice is not integrable. You can't apply Yang Baxter <laughs> technology. It's a miracle that bond percolation on the square lattice is integrable. Uh, <clears throat> side percolation on triangular lattice is integrable, and they both have critical uh, probability PC equal to one half. It's just a miracle. Most of the, most of the models you want to look at are not integrable. Uh, if I had the other set of uh, diagonals, instead of having this diagonal, keeping this diagonal, I kept this diagonal, then I'd have to go to a limit where, where that one goes to zero and keep this one. So that is built in. Oh, I how do I find that the model is? How do you define? Ah, how do I know? Is, how do I define integral uh, critical? Yes, integrable or critical? Oh. Yeah, so integrable just means it solves the Yang Baxter equation. Critical uh, comes into the properties of the correlations, power laws, as opposed to. Mm -hmm. As opposed to so if you're critical and you go to the continuous scaling limit, you get a CFT, which is what we see, and you'll see it too. If you're off critical and you go to the continuous scaling limit, you don't get a conformal field field, you get a quantum field field, and uh, it's massive, not massless. I'm just curious, do you need a critical point? Yeah, so the, these are only solvable at the critical point. Exactly integrable, like the solvable point. All right, we want to introduce boundaries because these are conjugate to the different uh, uh, representations and conformal ways that we see. So we introduce now triangles on the boundary. So of course we had two triangles here, but this triangle will be used on the boundary and carries with it a spectral parameter. And we're only going to look at the very simplest solution of the boundary yang Baxter equation, which is to set this guy equal to either a no loop segment well, a dashed line, which means no loop segment or a loop segment. As I said, there are actually an infinite number of uh, solutions to the boundary yang baxter equation, but we're only going to be using this simplest one. And um, <clears throat> here is the boundary yang baxter So you see there's U and V on these triangles, but actually this is independent of U and V in this situation. And we have U plus V here, U minus V there, and this one bounces down to here, basically. 
bounces one down to the lower position and uh, in, in interchange u and v. That's how this uh, equation works. So now we have the ingredients to uh, formulate the transfer matrices. So this is a single row transfer matrix. Uh, <clears throat> the, the boundary condition is periodic. So we can build up a cylinder by applying this transfer matrix many times. To build up a strip, we need a boundary condition on the left and the right. So these are given by the simplest possible triangles, the simplest possible boundary conditions. But now we need a double row. And when we completely, when we keep applying this one, we don't build up a cylinder, we build up a strip with the left and the right hand side. Uh, you can show diagrammatically that as you vary u, you get a commuting family here and likewise here. Notice the orientation of the faces. This is the bottom left hand corner so far, but this one is actually rotated. This marks the uh, reference corner, which used to sit in the bottom left corner. Now I said you have to act with these things diagrammatically on the vector space of states so that you can get matrix representations. And uh, the states that you need are different on the cylinder and on the strip. So maybe it's simpler to start with a strip. So if you have three sites, you want to keep track of connectivities. So that's what the loop segments do. They connect different sites. So you can have no loop segments. You can have one loop segment. It can occur in these two places and connect these two or these two or these two. And that's all that you can have. If you ha have one defect, what do I mean by a defect? You can have a single site that's effectively connects off to infinity above. So you can have a single side there, a single side there, a single side there, as one defect each, but then you can also connect the other two. Everything here is uh, planar. So these uh, defects and loop segments are not allowed to cross. Uh, here's what happens when you have two defects. So they're the uh, states you act on uh, for the strip. For the cylinder, you have periodic boundary conditions. So now again, you can have uh, empty sides or you can connect two sides with a loop segment, but you can also connect around the back of the period. So you get more space and you have to keep track of the way things are connected. So this is how you write down a matrix. You act with these guys diagrammatically on these states and that gives you a matrix. Now, uh, <clears throat> for the periodic boundary conditions, the single row transfer matrix, there is essentially no difference between the dilute loop model and the Azurgen and Coropin uh, 19 vertex model. In fact, they have the, the same spectrum. You just have to make the following relation. You set the uh, fugacity of non-contractible loops to omega plus omega inverse, where omega equal to e to the i gamma is the twist in the Azurgen Coropin model. And the spin SZ is plus or minus D. So the number of defects D, it's a quantum number, and it's related to the magnetization of the Azurgen Coropin model. Now, <clears throat> what do I mean by a non contractible loop? So we saw an example of a contractible loop at the beginning, just a closed little loop. Uh, the closed loop gets a fugacity which is minus two cos four lambda. And when lambda is pi on three, that's just one, which tells you that for percolation, these closed loops play no role. They can just be removed. That's the uh, statistical weight they get, beta equals one. So you can just remove them. But you can, uh, in the periodic case, you can form a loop segment that connects to itself by going around the cylinder. You can't contract that one. So it should be treated separately and it comes with a separate uh, weight. So the weight fugacity of the non-contractible loops is alpha and it's related to the twist of Azurgen Coropin in this way. On the strip, you lose the connection between the loop model and the Azurgen Coropin model. Uh, <clears throat> moreover, you don't have a simple symmetry of this kind. It's not crossing symmetric which means in general, the eigenvalues are complex. So on the cylinder, it's natural to expect complex eigenvalues because you have complex momentum. But on the strip, usually 
uh, <coughs> for simple rational models, you get a symmetric uh, double row transfer matrix, which means that the spectra is real, and that's something that you want to look for uh, for the conformal field theory. But here, that's not the case. The eigenvalues of this guy are actually complex. That's a complication we'll come back to. Also, usually at uh, u equals zero, these transfer matrices simplify to the, uh, <coughs> the uh, twist operator, shift operator, I should say shift operator or to the identity, but that doesn't hold here either. And that property is needed to access the uh, logarithmic derivative, which gives you the quantum Hamiltonian associated with this two-dimensional exactly solvable model. So here there are no simple Hamiltonians. The Hamiltonians are rather complicated, so they're not much help. All right, so how do we solve in <clears throat> this model? We use functional equations. The idea of functional equations goes back to uh, Baxter. And let's start on the cylinder with a single row transfer matrix. And here's our non-contractible loop way. Let's introduce sine factors, sigma and u related to n and the quantum number d, the number of defects. And we introduce this trigonometric function, just the nth power of our s. Now, from a previous paper, we can show that the transfer matrix T satisfies this cubic functional equation. So this I is the identity, J is a central element. It just means it commutes with everybody and has these eigenvalues in terms of D and the twist. Can so you this by the graph that is by the diagram that you use. So uh, yes, everything starts with the diagrams and you build things up uh, algebraically slowly. And uh, you use local properties of the faces to show that uh, these things can commute, commute diagrammatically. And then uh, there is a, a closure when you start to fuse these objects, which tells you more. And it tells you that they satisfy polynomial equations. In this case, it's just a cubic because it's pi on three in, in essence. Yeah, so that's uh, a lot of work actually goes into setting up this functional equation, but this is the key to solving for the spectra, because now we have this matrix functional equation, then uh, this functional equation with these eigenvalues must be satisfied by all the eigenvalues. And if we can find solutions of this uh, cubic, that tells us the eigenvalues. So that's what we want to do, solve this cubic. Now, it turns out if you introduce this auxiliary function, this is Baxter's Q, if you like, of the beta ansatz. And um, <clears throat> then you define T in terms of this Q. This is eigenvalues now. These are no longer matrices, so I can just divide. So this is just a complicated function of uh, these uh, Qs with this uh, scalar trigonometric function. You take that and you substitute it in here for the scalar equation. And you find that this equation is automatically satisfied provided minus one to the m, so m is the number of beta roots, uj, is equal to sigma nu. That is, that's the uh, product of these two sine functions. And moreover, this uh, zeta is the cube root of unity. So this is, again, related to pi on three. So that means to find the solution of the cubic, we only have to find the solution to the beta ansatz equations. And there's a lot of technology to do that. In addition, we find that there are linear equations. If you know T, there are linear equations in P and Q, which enable you to solve for Q and P if you know T. That's very useful uh, numerically. So what happens with this equation when you put U equal to zero? When you, to this equation, when you put U equal to zero, uh, nothing, useful or helpful. <laughs> it's satisfied, but uh, when you said u equal to zero, this object is already complicated with a non-trivial spectrum. It's much, much easier to deal with the full object where you can really see the structure and use it. With, without the structure, you, you, you see nothing. So it's not useful. It's satisfied, and that's all that can be said. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, um, what is the uh, dimension of the matrix T? Ah, the dimension is the dimension because we formed, uh, so if n is three and you're looking at a single row, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states. 
So the dimension is seven by seven. Because you act with this guy, I accept n is equal to three, three faces on these states and form a seven by seven matrix. Now, of course, you can count these guys. It's easy. They're, they're given by uh, numbers related to Catalan. So we know exactly the dimension. I didn't write it down, sorry. Okay, something very similar happens on the strip. We get the cubic at the end, but now we just have minus four here. Things are somewhat simpler. We don't have the uh, sine functions entering. F is uh, defined differently. We have a two n power now because we have two n faces instead of n. This Q is uh, very similar, but the index runs from minus m to m, and we break that apart with plus or minus uh, the beta roots. And there is always a root at uh, u equals zero, which is actually related to the boundary condition here. That's an order one term. Again, we can define uh, a d of u in terms of q's, substitute it in there, and we find that equation is automatically satisfied. And we can get these linear equations given d. There are linear equations in q and p so that we can calculate q and p. And p is defined this way in terms of the q's. So the Q's, the P's, the T's, and D's, they're all low on polynomials in either the I or U. So on the computer, you're just dealing with polynomials. Now, <laughs> next we have to move to more complicated auxiliary functions, the Q's and the auxiliary function. We now look at certain combinations of these Q's. We call it lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, on the cylinder, or the strip, it's following Fuji and Klumpa and Dama Rao in 2008. And uh, these terms are nothing more but the terms that appear on the right-hand side of the beta ansatz equations. So when you sum them together, you just get back T or D. Now, uh, remarkably, if you look at these functions and define Y1 to be this combination, Y2 to be this combination, and Y3, to be given by this combination in terms of uh, y n's with smaller n's. So this is a recursion. So you can define such a y n recursively for any n greater than or equal to three. What you find is you get uh, a system that is exhibiting a period five and closes. And because of the way you define these, they satisfy this y system. Y n minus one by y n plus one is one plus y n. Now, why systems, uh, going back to Zamological, are for the key for solving spectra when you have integrability. In this case, this is y1, this is y2, this is y3, y4, y5 in terms of the lambdas, and it closes. Now, this particular y system occurred in the paper of Liossi and Tateo in 1995, but they weren't studying any statistical uh, physics system. They were just studying dialogue identities, and it's known that uh, uh, dialogue identities are related to Y systems. And here, if we take a braid limit, we take U, the spectral parameter goes to plus or minus I infinity, we get precisely uh, the functions that appeared in Liossi and Tateo that are related to dialogue rhythms, and I'll come back to that later. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in fact, we have a six functional uh, relations relating y and of u with uh, n equal one, two, and three to uh, products and ratios of t, q, and p. <clears throat> and that's true on the cylinder and similarly on the strip with d, q, and p. And uh, those uh, functional relations can be converted to nonlinear integral equations. This, uh, goes back to a technique I developed with Plumper in, back in 1992. But now from those six, you can eliminate T, Q, and P, and that leaves three nonlinear equations in Y1, Y2, and Y3. So we're down back to Y to the first three. And also you can eliminate Q and P in those three equations, nonlinear integral equations. And uh, they give you an, a nonlinear integral equation for the finite size corrections in T or D. So they relate to the sum of the lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. So you have all of these equations that you can work with and solve. There are mathematical techniques that enable you to solve them analytically. 
And that's what we did. And that's a complicated procedure. So I'm not even going to attempt to describe it here. But here are the basic parameters. This is the non-contractible loop fugacity. This is the twist factor. Here are the conformal weights that are expected given by the uh, catch table. And that's exactly what we find. On the cylinder, there are two copies of Viorosaur, delta, delta bar, and they take these values. So gamma is related to the twist. D is the number of defects. And these are the labels R and S in the catch formula for the conformal weights. On the strip, there's only one copy of Viorosaur. So uh, delta bar doesn't really exist. There's only one delta. And it's given solely in terms of the defect number. There is no twist anymore. And uh, in the catch table, that occurs at uh, position one, B plus one. So these are analytic results. Now, uh, these, these results on the cylinder were previously obtained by Bachelor, Nienhaus, and Weiler. They had two papers where they used two different methods. Firstly, just beta ansatz, and second, nonlinear integral equation techniques that we developed. Uh, and they, they obtained these results. So our new methods agree with uh, their results. In solving the nonlinear integral equations, ultimately we need one identity involving Rogers die logarithms. So this is a special function. It's given by logarithmic type integrals. It's denoted by L, but it's more convenient for us to work with L plus. And uh, the form of the identity is this. Uh, sum over n, one to three of L plus. Here is the, the yn functions that I defined. Infinity means in the braid limit and they're functions of t, where t is actually this combination of the twist and the defect number. But this identity is true for arbitrary complex t and the sum is just pi squared on three. <clears throat> so we need, we need uh, the braid limit we need uh, to, in solving the nonlinear integral equations, we need a handle on the behavior as u goes to plus or minus infinity. And that's where the braid limit comes in. So the braid limits, u goes to i infinity, for example, of the five y functions. That's just these. The infinity means the braid limit. They're functions of this t. And they're this uh, simple functions of t. So you substitute those in and uh, <coughs> you get this three-term dialogue identity. Now, that's unusual because dialogue rhythms are known to solve or satisfy a five-term identity, which is this one. That's known as uh, Abel's uh, identity. In general, it has two parameters, but this is a one-parameter specialization of it. So a five-term identity is known, and there's a two-term identity known as Euler's identity. It's just... Uh, L plus of t plus L plus one on t is pi squared on six. And you see t and one on t are the last two arguments here. Our identity involves the first three. So there's an identity involving the five and the two. So basically, the, from these two known identities, you get precisely the identity that we need. <clears throat> Oh, okay, well, I'm about halfway through, so we may have to speed up. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> we, we want to build up the conformal partition functions next, so we have to deal with uh, traces on the strip and on the cylinder. So if we work with a long uh, cylinder, then uh, we can conjecture the form for the conformal partition function on the cylinder. So if you fix the number of defects on the, the cylinder, that is you just take a trace of the power of the transfer matrix and move to the continuum scaling limit, <laughs> what we find is that the, uh, the so-called uh, standard module, so this is acting on the standard vector space of states that I showed earlier. When you do that, the spectrum of the transfer matrices tends out to be given by this expression, where Q is the modular parameter, Q and Q bar, and uh, omega is the twist, and this uh, is the time eta function. So <clears throat> we obtain this only numerically, so it's a conjecture. Similarly, on the strip, so now we 
act with a double wave transfer matrix, build up a long strip and look at the uh, spectra in the continuum scaling limit, we get this. And this is precisely the uh, cat's character, the logarithmic cat's character, which is given by this formula. It goes back to uh, a paper with Rasmussen and uh, Zubair. And that was expected, but uh, it's what's borne out by extensive numerics. So the only confirmation we have for these formulas is uh, numerics. So you have to remove the bulk and the uh, boundary term to have a look at the finite size corrections from which you get the conformal uh, spectrum, which is up here. And what you should really do is express everything as a uh, Q series, and then each term in the Q series uh, represents one eigenvalue. So numerically, we looked at uh, D ranging from zero to eight. I'll show you some numerics soon. Now, to do numerics, you want to solve the beta answers equations. But to do that uh, stably on a computer, it's better to take the log. And in the beta answers equations, you always have signs like this entering when you write Q explicitly in terms of the beta roots. So the beta roots here now with I, V, J. And there's this nice identity. So when you use that, then the beta answers equation takes this form, where these uh, integers are related to the jump discontinuities in the uh, branch of these two functions. You can do exactly the same thing on the cylinder. So that's the strip. On the cylinder, things are a little more complicated. You have a twist, and you have this zeta. So zeta is e to the i calligraphic p. That's what enters here. p is 0, plus or minus 2 pi uh, on 3. That's because this is related to the cube root of unity. And again, we have uh, integers. So this is a more convenient form to solve these equations stably. So let me show you what a typical extrapolation looks like. So on a machine, we went from system sizes 20 up to 38 in increments of two. We look at the uh, log of the particular eigenvalue evaluated at u equals uh, pi on six. We get a set of numbers for those sizes. And now we start to extrapolate and we use uh, extrapolation accelerator, Vandenbroek Schwarz, which gives us the subsequent columns. And as you move to the right, the columns should converge better and better. So you can see here it's uh, converging to three and two thirds, and here it's converging to one. So that says that uh, delta plus delta bar is uh, three, three and two thirds. That's 11 thirds, and delta minus delta bar is what? So we can read off the conformal weights delta and delta bar. So this is the 25th eigenvalue. You can analyze lots and lots of eigenvalues this way, but you need the pattern of zeros initially, and what you do is you just put more and more zeros along these two lines as you increase the system size. You do the same thing on the strip. Now the eigenvalues uh, are complex. Normally you have complex conjugation symmetry. Here they're slightly broken. You can see these are not quite at the same level. But as you extrapolate, it doesn't matter whether you extrapolate the real part or the absolute value, it converges to the same number here, six. So we conclude that um, in, in the uh, scaling limit or thermodynamic limit, uh, the imaginary Part does not contribute. And so here, the conformal weight delta is equal to six, and we went from system size 22 to 40 in uh, steps of two. And in this case, it relates to the ninth eigenvalue in the D equals zero sector. So here is the D equals zero sector. Here plotted out is in the table is lots of properties of these eigenvalues in terms of the uh, uh, quantum numbers that uh, enter and uh, describing the patterns of zeros. But when you take all those into account and you solve the numerics, you can calculate the first 56 eigenvalues. And here's the Q series. And we see that that exactly matches uh, the catch character chi 1 1. So we can be confident that uh, <clears throat> in this sector on the strip, the standard module gives just that. Cat's character, which should be 
Remember, one d plus one, d is zero, so d plus one is one. That's the vacuum sector. Um, <clears throat> so now, oh, <laughs> that should be d equals one. Sorry for that. I was wondering why, why is this different when I see d equals zero? d equals one, so d plus one is two. That's just a typo. Again, here's a table of the properties of these eigenvalues. This time, we looked at the first 52 eigenvalues and get the first 52 uh, contributions to the character. So let's uh, look at a summary. <clears throat> From the extensive numerics, we deduced that C equals zero. There are no finite size corrections for the largest eigenvalues. And then for excitations, these are the conformal weights. And uh, here are our truncated characters. We can only go so far numerically, but you can see all of these numbers come out correctly. So that gives us confidence that our conjecture is correct. We want to do uh, similar things for the uh, cylinder and torus. So we want to start on the cylinder and we want to close it to a torus. We're interested in getting the modular invariant partition function. So here's the original system. You can extend it by periodicity, horizontally and vertically, or you, you can uh, change the boundary condition. So instead of being periodic, you can go to so-called anti-periodic boundary conditions, which just means that you interchange purple and white color. So you see here, it goes, in the original system, it goes purple, purple, white, purple. Uh, uh, no, the other way. It goes. So this is horizontal, this is vertical. So yeah, yeah. So you see here it goes purple, purple, white, purple, but up here it goes white, white, purple, white. So as you translate in one one direction upwards, you reverse the colors. If you uh, translate one uh, horizontally, you don't change change the colors. And so there's four possible uh, boundary conditions in closing the cylinder to a torus. It can be periodic and anti-periodic in horizontal or vertical. So four different partition functions to calculate. <laughs> On the cylinder, the cylinder looks like this. Uh, here is the loop segments, and you can uh, straighten it up so that you have uh, square faces. But now you can see I can have fixed purple on the left. I can have uh, fixed white on the right. That's zero, one. But I could also have zero, zero, uh, one, zero, or one, one. So I could have purple and purple, but due to uh, duality, that's the same as white and white. So there are only two independent uh, boundary conditions on the strip. All right, so <clears throat> what we do is we, we start with the conjecture for the traces of powers of the transfer matrix, that's the standard modules. And uh, <clears throat> We want to break it up so that we're summing over mod six. So we define the zj this way. It's convenient to put the Dedekind eta functions on this side. And then there's a whole lot of uh, mathematical uh, manipulation. And uh, what you find is that at the end, everything simplifies when you're looking at this eta equal to zero or one, where uh, eta equal zero or one just means the gamma, the twist factor. Remember, omega is e to the i gamma, that's either zero or pi. And those two are important when you close to a cylinder. And that means that this zj, which is the building block, j runs from zero to five now because everything's summed out mod six. Uh, these guys are simply related to uh, <coughs> sesquilinear forms in affine characters, which I'll define on the next slide. So the affine characters are actually given here. So somehow a higher uh, symmetry, affine symmetry is emerging. Uh, here are the parameters we're working with. And now we can use the Markov trace. This tells you how you close the cylinder to a strip. So a cylinder to a torus, this is the toroidal partition function with boundary conditions A and B in the horizontal and vertical where A and B are zero, one. Is just given by this sum. And these guys in here, they're the standard module traces that we conjecture. 
So when we uh, substitute those in, expressed in terms of the affine characters, this is what we get. So there are four possibilities. H is zero or one, V is zero or one, and you see a V appears here somewhere. But if I set V equal to zero, then all of these characters uh, <clears throat> appear with uh, positive coefficients, and that's the modular invariant partition function on the torus, which is a basic, uh, uh, one of the basic quantities of the conformal data. We can do the same sort of thing with a cylinder. Now we have to close the strip to a cylinder. And again, there is a Markov trace formula that enables you to do that. And here it is. We have to specialize again. Uh, did we do that here? Yes, <clears throat> I, I snuck it in without pointing to it. I specialize to the non-contractible loop fugacity to the value two so that we could do this. It's more complicated if you have some other value of alpha, you don't have these simplifications. But anyway, with alpha equal to two, the Markov trace is given by this simple formula in terms of the standard module traces and powers of the double row transfer matrix for boundary conditions labeled by A and B, equal to zero and one. And there's only two that are independent. That's these two. And now we find these formulas. Again, you can express them in terms of the viewer. This is an infinite sum of viewer sorrow characters, cat's characters, sorry. Uh, but you can combine that into uh, formulas that just involve the affine characters and their derivatives evaluated at z equal to one. So after all of this hard work, we've got all of these expressions for the various uh, conformal properties. How does it compare with what we saw when we did the analytic calculation for bond percolation on the square lattice? So critical bond percolation on the square lattice we, we did in 2017, as we were starting up the first uh, network. And um, <clears throat> we obtained the central charge, the conformal weights, the characters, both the uh, cats and affine, and uh, conformal partition functions on the torus and the cylinder. And we did that analytically. Now we have to use a mixture of analytic uh, methods for the conformal weights, but numerical for the... Uh, yeah, analytic for the central charge and conformal waste, but numerical for the conformal uh, partition functions. So bond percolation is described by the A11 loop model, that's SL2, this is A22, this is SL3. Despite being described by SL2 and SL3 models respectively, all of the conformal data that I listed here obtained for these two percolation models precisely coincide. That's what we wanted to see. What this is telling you is that the concurrence of all this conformal data provides compelling evidence supporting a strong form of universality. This is no longer just comparing uh, the values of critical exponents. It's a strong, very strong form of uh, universality between these uh, two logarithmic conformal field theories. And in fact, they're both stochastic. And that's the message I want to finish with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for this impressive lecture and many interesting results. It's good time for some questions. What exactly you did in the numeric? What exactly what you did in the numeric to calculate the uh, weight? Mm, sorry? What did you do to calculate the uh, weight numerically? Uh, so, 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 what, what did what, I do with what did you do to calculate the weight? To calculate the weight numerically. A uh, conformal weight. Yeah. Ah, yeah, so I, I didn't um, give the formula because uh, I prepared this um, talk for people who work traditionally in this area. So there are, you, <clears throat> if you look at a, a lattice model of system size n, then look at the large n behavior. Uh, the first term you see is of order n, that's the bulk free energy. It grows with the system size, is extensive. The next term you see is of order one, that's related to the boundary free energy. And then the next term down is order one on n, and that's related to conformal uh, data. That one on n finite size correction tells you the central charge and the conformal weight. And that's the correction that we calculate analytically to obtain the expressions for the conformal weights. And it's exactly the, the same 
uh, formula we use numerically in extrapolating. Yeah, in, in extrapolating numbers like this. So I'm <clears throat> maybe it's clearer than one before. I'm looking at the log of the largest eigen uh, of the eigenvalue that I'm interested in. I, I know the order n term that's given by the bulk free energy, that's known. So I separate that off, I divide it out. And then I know the boundary free energy. For the cylinder case, there's no boundary free energy. Actually, the bound cylinder or strip is the same, no boundary free energy. And then I look at the one on n corrections. So this is just looking at the one on n corrections as I increase the system size. And you see they converge very rapidly. Sorry, one, one uh, stupid question. Uh, that, uh, what do you uh, I want to have some, some comments about the universal uh, explain that. What does it mean? The, 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 does it mean that the, uh, no difference uh, between the SL2 and the SL3 the, uh, regarding the population? Or the, how, how can I extend the? Uh, What's the quantity? Okay, so uh, I have to be honest now. Let me explain that I am cheating. Uh, the SL3 A22 model is uh, much more complicated. It has certain regimes. I'm looking at a regime where it displays this A11-like behavior. It's the simplest regime. In other regimes, it uh, has more complicated behavior related to proper SL3 models. Not, uh, um, not what we're seeing here. And in particular, another regime, it has, uh, it describes a non compact CFT related to uh, black holes. So the model itself is very complicated, which derives from the fact that there's uh, SL3 underneath. And I'm just looking at a certain parameter range where the behavior of this model is simple. The other parameter uh, ranges, the behavior is understood. But it gives a much more complicated uh, CFT. So, certain parameter regime, and you see some university here. Yeah, so the regime here is u between zero and lambda, and uh, uh, lambda here has to be uh, pi on three. Yes. Thank you. More questions? Uh, maybe just uh, one from me. So this is all for 2D systems. Yes. That is, uh, yes. What about 3D then? Yes, what about them? You, you can't talk about um, <clears throat> loop segments because if you have clusters in three dimension, you have to surrender by a surface. Right. So your degrees of freedom would be surfaces. And uh, you'd have to think about isotopy of uh, surfaces. And uh, in three dimensions, you do not expect simple rational uh, critical exponents and rational conformal weights. In fact, they're not known as actual numbers. So, yes, and uh, Yang Baxter techniques, they rely on equations like this. So, they're inherently two dimensional. If you move to three dimensions, instead of having squares, you have uh, cubes. And instead of uh, in the Yang Baxter equation, instead of fitting <clears throat> three uh, squares together. Basically, when you glue these, you get uh, hexagons on the left and right. <clears throat> now you have to glue four cubes together. And then as you push certain cubes through, you, you get an identity like this one. What I'm trying to say is that life is much more complicated for this uh, so-called tetrahedron equation. There are only a few solutions known. One was uh, due to uh, Zamolodzikov, which was greatly simplified by uh, Baxter and uh, Bezhanov. But life is really difficult there. You have to start using spherical geometry instead of uh, regular trigonometry. <laughs> and uh, what is worse, the solutions of the tetrahedron equation that we know don't have physical properties. That is to say, if we're going to make real progress, we have to find other solutions which better reflect uh, behavior of real three-dimensional systems. I mean, for two-dimensional systems, for example, on the hard hexagons, they've done experiments. Uh, you just deposit um, uh, krypton on graphite, and that gives you a hard hexagon model to the first approximation, as long as the density is not too high, and they've measured these uh, critical exponents, and they 
agree very nicely with the analytic calculations of so Rodney Baxter. What did they measure? They measured the uh, heat capacity alpha exponent. But they, they can also measure other things. Okay. Seems to be no more questions. So let's thank Paul again. Thank you very much.